Hello and welcome to another Pilates Hour. We'll let you get checked in here. We've got a big crowd today. Of course, it's Beth Kaplanik who is <laughs> joining that crowd. I believe I asked if we had, do we have at least 500 people today? And I get, no, you got Beth on today. You have over 900 people registered. We know that the topic Pretty is amazing. a hot one, so we're glad to yeah. have you on. Let's get started. We have a lot to talk about today. Beth is a uh, comes from the nursing background, education background, a couple of decades at least of Pilates, both classical and rehabilitation based. I have the personal privilege of having her as a colleague at our clinic and studio in South Miami. And uh, she is also the author of Pilates for Hip and Knees, Syndromes and Arthroplasties, which will give you the lead and uh, uh, link for that book in the presentation. Uh, she has been a leader. She's spoken at many conferences, particularly the PMA conference, and, and has taught about arthritis. She also is a leader in bone health, for especially for women, and, and looking at osteoporosis as well. We'll need to make sure we differentiate those today. Yeah. Today, we're really looking at osteoarthritis. OA is often how we refer to it. So, Beth, welcome, and it's always Thank great you. to have you on the Pilates Hour. Any any hot topics on your mind right now? In, oh, wow. I've got lots of hot topics. Well, you got, but I'm very excited. To share something, something new that uh, you're thinking about. Something new I'm thinking about in terms of this presentation, I can't wait to share with everybody. I happen to be, osteoarthritis happens to be near and dear to my heart, um, mainly because I've had so much of it myself. I've had my share of that. So that's always... Um, I'm always humbled. Yesterday, I had a new client come in with two knee replacements who waited five years for seeing me, and she knew she's known me for years. And I'm always humbled by what I explore and learn with new people as they walk in. I think that in, in I was reminded of that today. It was a new ah uh ah, -uh, like wow. Every time I get a client, it still happens. I learn something new that I didn't know That's or. So true. And then, and then how I'm going to make this work and or how I'm going to make work for this person who clearly needs this. She uh, just a real quick story, went to Mayo Clinic, had them replaced, went back about uh, four weeks ago and they did every study in the world because she's got still lots of snowmeal fluid and a buildup of fluid in her knees and feels like she's got chunks in her knees and difficult to walk and so on and so forth. And she absolutely looks the epitome of health. Otherwise, they sent her away, say, you're absolutely fine. You just have mm -hmm. one leg longer and one leg shorter you're fine. And she really needs, after one session yesterday, she started feeling better with her legs and, and knees. And she could see where she's going to get a little more cleaning out of the house and building the new, the, the new, the new pattern for her knees. So I'm really excited that, and I was, a, that was an awe, awe for me. It was a five-year-old post-op coming in fresh, not knowing Pilates and experiencing something really good. So that was another humbling experience. That's me. that's great. And it always is that way, isn't it? Whenever we get a new client and we see the power of the tools that we have and how, you know, people who are very frustrated with traditional uh, care or lack of care and, and sort of have that gloom and doom outlook. And then all of a sudden you figure out a way to provide some hope for them. And right. the next thing you know, their their whole affect changes. I had the great privilege this last week of going to the physical therapies combined section meeting in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh -huh. So there are about 10,000 people there. And I got a chance to listen to one of my favorite. I've talked about him quite a bit on the show, Adrian Lowe, uh, his pain neuroscience education. And it was interesting. One of the things that kept coming up in all of their presentations was you know, we need to educate our clients and our patients about what pain is and what pain's for. But they kept saying that it, that the catalyst that goes with pain education is successful movement experiences. And I about fell right. out of my seat because, you know, Beth, you and I have been talking about creating successful movement experiences since the mm -hmm. first time we met. Right. And how do we create these positive movement experiences? And uh, there's no better topic for us to talk about pertaining to positive movement experiences right. than osteoarthritis at the lower extremities. There just isn't. It, the, all of the research is pointing clearly uh, to that. So what I wanted to do before we start talking about things, Beth, is I wanted to do a little poll and just okay. sort of see where our listeners are at with their understanding of osteoarthritis. Again, 
The more that you participate, the better it is for Beth and I to be able to share information with you. So this is a basic question of, uh, it's a little tricky. I want to tell mm -hmm. you that I'm being a little yeah. tricky here, but what percentage of adults between the age of 20 and 40 have moderate OA? We often think of it as being an old person's uh, disease right. or impairment, which I, as, as Beth said, she fights it all the time and I fight it all the time. But what about the 20 to 40 crew? I bet there's a lot of you out there that are in that 20 to 40. And, you know, what is, you know, what, what do you think? So as you're answering that question, we'd love to see at least 50 or so answer that. There was a question that came in from Liz Batty. She says, I will be having a hip replacement later this year. I've watched your workshops regarding anterior replacement surgery. I'll be having tissue saving surgery, but the scar is lateral posterior. What differences are there regarding rehab? So I'll come back to that question mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a little bit later when we talk about surgery. And mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be focusing a lot on the knee today. But trust me, uh, when we talk about the knee, we also often have to talk about the hip and the ankle. So they, they all sort of go together. So Liz, I'll be addressing that. And Melissa, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and open it up so we can see what people are thinking. <clears throat> okay. All right. All right. So I'm not going to give the answer until we get to that slide, Beth. So okay. we're going to keep that a little quiet. Okay. But you guys are seeing that your, your answers are predominantly in the 10 to 50% range and a few of you in the 51 to 80%. So let's go to the next question. Mm -hmm. What percentage of adults without symptoms or pain might have osteoarthritis as per imaging diagnosis? So what this means is, if we went out and just took everybody, people that don't have any joint pain <clears throat> as adults, and we did an x-ray or MRI of their whole body, their muscle skeletal system, what percentage of them would show signs of osteoarthritis? And I'm talking about 20 and over. So let's see what you think about that one. And this is one that really got me too. Uh, I think this is one of the terms we use is false positive diagnoses that um, when you see how many people don't have pain that actually have the pathology, and then you see somebody with the pain and they go get an x-ray and they show the pathology, we have to ask the question, is the pain related to the pathology or something else when there's such a high percentage? So that's a, a little hint on this mm -hmm. question for you. Mm -hmm. And let's go ahead and show the answers to this one, Melissa. Okay. So again, looking, and now we're getting to some pretty high numbers, right? So 50%, over 75% of adults, we're saying in this, in this poll, mm -hmm. are dealing with uh, no symptoms, but they have uh, signs of degeneration or osteoarthritis in their imaging. And again, mm -hmm. we'll answer it in the dialogue today. Let's go to the next question. So what are the risk factors for osteoarthritis? And I want you to rate these. Which one do you think is the highest, <clears throat> excuse me, the highest risk factor? And which one do you think is the next, the next, the next? Again, just go through it and do the best you can. Um, I certainly was, I'm always surprised when I come back to it. I know the first two, but I don't always remember the third and the fourth. And this is something that in Beth's course, I need to mention, Beth teaches a great course for us in, uh, in Polestar about um, osteoarthritis and particularly the lower extremities. And uh, it's a great course and that's coming up soon. Um, Sarah is asking if we can better define osteoarthritis and we're gonna go through a whole yeah. Yeah. definition of it. OA stands for osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. So this is the wear and tear. Um, <clears throat> I don't even like to really use the word disease, but it affects so many people. We put it into a disease category, but uh, it affects everybody. Yeah. All right. Let's open this one up and see what people think are the greatest risk factors. What's the poll? So right now we say injury and overuse, genetics, number two, obesity, number three, and age, number four. Hmm. What do you think, Beth? We can talk about this one right now. Yeah. Well, it's in interesting. Um, they're not bad, are they? They're not doing too no, bad no. on that. Are they? No, the only one I would move around, I would just yeah. move genetics down to number four and leave everything yeah. else in that order. Yeah. I, I, so, obesity, obesity, obesity is number two. Number yeah. two. Mm -hmm. Good. 
Awesome, guys. Well done. Let's go to the Very next uh, slide. Very good. <clears throat> so here, I'm going to turn a little bit of this over to you, Beth. This is mm -hmm. your specialty and some slides that are excerpts mm -hmm. from your course. Right. And so again, if you were um, taking uh, Beth's course, you'd be going to much greater depth. These are just a few slides that she's pulled out to be able to talk about it today. So Beth, the baton's yours. If I okay. interrupt, I promise to raise my hand. So just keep <laughs> an eye out for me. That's great. Well, you know, it's as you guys have already known, and you're going to see more on some slides coming down, it's the most under-recognized chronic condition out there, whether you really are exemplifying symptoms or not. It's there. The wear and tear of it is there on most all individuals on some level if you scan the entire body. What we have in statistics, and, and Brent is not really great on prevalence. I always like to look at prevalence. I kind of like want to know where it is. I'm just like one of those statistical people. But you know, this is, study is already a little old and it's showing this at 59.4 million Americans have some sort of arthritis. And we look at it globally, it's much bigger. As a matter of fact, if you take hip, knee, hand, uh, spine, and, uh, all, and all of those things in the condition mm -hmm. we're talking about is the fourth largest global disability. So it's very large and 80, about 85% of that is, is real reference to the hip and knee. Osteoarthritis, there are many different types of arthritis, but we're talking about just osteoarthritis, which tends to be more aware and tear, but there are definitely some systemic inflammatory conditions that can cause osteoarthritis besides just wear and tear. And it's a breaking down of the articular cartilage. And as you can see in this, this picture here, you have exposed subchondral bone underneath the articular cartilage, which is like slide and glide and moves beautifully, which creates that nice motion. And as most of you know, then it's also bathed with synomial fluid, which is the nourishment that our, the articular cartilage needs to stay healthy, the bathing of that articular cartilage is very important. So when you get irritated synomial fluid, and wear and tear and the breakdown of the cartilage, you have much more irritated synovial fluid, which continues to break down cartilage, which creates an inflammatory condition. And so we want to work on what things we can do to create an anti-inflammatory environment to create the best environment possible to keep the nourishment going properly for the articular cartilage so we have less breakdown. So this is really important, I think, for all of you to understand. So we really need to not just say we have it, we need to find steps to get ourselves in a place where we get a little homeostasis and, and maybe delay or, or detour the breakdown of the articular cartridge. Osteoarthritis today is not just for older people, as you can see. I mean, we've got a major increase of individuals between age 40 and 55. It's amazing how many more individuals are suffering from osteoarthritis. And, um, when it gets severe, it's like, it's a total joint failure. Um, and as you see in the numbers there, this is just some hip and knee numbers, one in two Americans and two and three obese will likely get knee OA. And that seems to be the leader, the knees for sure. And one in four Americans or about 25% of the population will develop hip OA. And, um, and that's very costly, right? And it's very, not just costly for the, the amount of care you need, but costly to the individual who has osteoarthritis, who loses work and time and can't make the money they need, which also affects their well-being and their quality of life. So that's a little bit to help answer for Sarah. And there's more to it, a little more to it. The pathogenesis of OA can get very deep. We're not going to get at that deep, deep concept of the chemistry of that but we do need to do a lot of things to create a beautiful environment to deter or prevent further breakdown. Very good. Hey, you know, one of the things that came to my mind was, you know, these, a lot of the people on the uh, webinar today have listened to many, many case studies talking about knee pathology and other pathologies, but just inside the uh, chat, um, let's ask you guys to do another little thing. This time I'll see your names, but what do you think would be some of the leading causes of excessive stress to the knee? Since the knee is the primary mm -hmm. joint, where do you think some of those stresses come from based on some of our discussions over the last year or two? And you just pop that into your chat session because I don't have a question for it. So I see running, kneeling. Right. I'm looking for some place where you have decreased mobility that would lead to knee wear and tear. 
see if anybody comes up with the one that I talk about a lot. Oh, somebody did ankle mobility. Mm -hmm. Good. So a loss of dorsiflexion, loss mm -hmm. of hip extension, mm -hmm. loss of deceleration strength in the hip and the pelvis. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the leading causes that there becomes excessive stress to the knee. And as we'll talk about, the knee loses its congruency. And because it's always load bearing in the human being, we're a bipedal animal, that it takes the brunt of that wear and tear. And so, you know, when you think going back, how do we, you know, work on alignment mm -hmm. and congruency and distribution of force that we talk about are going to be some fundamental things. Yeah. So if, if we, if I tag on what Brent said, lack of dorsiflexion, hip extension, doing two biggies, also thoracic extension, we're going to add it in there, right? right. Balance the lateral line of the body. I, I would put those five right in that big category. Um, then those are the things that you're going to target in your programs. Just giving you a heads up on that before we go there. Yeah, good. Let's go to the next slide. And by the way, just looking at those numbers, and these numbers are accurate. I, I, I went back and was looking at some studies today too, Beth, and it was like, you know, the CDC's numbers are current and they're 32.5 million Americans suffering from osteoarthritis. It's only like a couple of years old on the study. So if anything, well, yeah, it's increased. One of them... Uh, all types of arthritis versus just for knee and hip. It's I was different. just looking for osteoarthritis of the knee. It was, okay. I mean, it was yeah, yeah, 32.5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's people complaining of pain. They get x-rayed that have it. That's not actually people that have degeneration or osteoarthritis right. that's asymptomatic. Exactly. That's a, exactly. All right, why don't you go ahead and continue with this slide, Beth? Well, this I, I want, we don't want to dwell on this, but this is a study that came out in 2017 at the Journal of Orthopedic uh, and Sports PT. And it just showed the amount of individuals between 40 and, 50, 40 and 55 who are suffering from osteoarthritis or have symptomatic osteoarthritis. And in, this was the highlights as to what were the reasons. People was why so much? Why so much? Well, obesity is huge. And uh, two out of three people for the knee uh, who are obese are most likely to have knee, knee pain, whatever that reason be. So weight management is a number one tr uh, treatment for osteoarthritis, physical activity and weight, uh, weight management. So we got to really work on that. So obesity. Then the history of traumatic knee injury. We've got more kids playing sports, going out early, a lot more ACL injuries, a lot more meniscal tears. An ACL injury and meniscal tear can definitely develop knee OA in their lifetime. There's a, there's a higher prevalence that I should never say, not like one in three people for sure. And x-ray findings of OA changes as high as 50 to 90% a decade later after rupturing the ACL on an average basis. And then we, when we get into the hip, we're talking about Femoral acetabulin impingement or hip dysplasia can have a tenfold increase of progressing potentially to hip end stage OA within, a, within five to 20 years. So the high impact sports um, are definitely one of the reasons that we're leading towards that. And then of course, if you're not rehab correctly, getting your alignment back into order, maintaining like keeping the congruence in the joint and doing all the other anti-inflammatory things you need to do then there's a progression. So obesity, traumatic injury, and um, are leading some of the ways of reasons why we have an increase in this population at this age. And this totally affects the psychological well-being and work capacity of an individual. So, you know, I was going to put a little another note in here on this and um, mm -hmm. very good study. The a lot of people wrote down running that running was, you know, sort of bad for the knees. And there is a stereotype of that out there. But I want to make it clear that it's a human right to run. It is mm -hmm. part of human locomotion. What I will tell you is that jogging is not a human natural locomotion. Um, but walking, running, and sprinting are normal human locomotions. Jogging was invented by Nike with a wedged heel. So um, that is one that does put an abnormal amount of stress through the knee. So people that sort of walk or, or run with a heel strike is what you'd be talking about with the jogging. And mm -hmm. if you don't have the ankle dorsiflexion that we were meant to have. So if you go to countries where they still squat a lot, they squat to go to the bathroom, they squat for socialization, they squat for work with heels down, they have that ankle dorsiflexion, do not have the same incidence of knee pathology and injuries. 
And what would be an interesting study, and I've never seen anything about this, but um, people who play sports that have decent ankle range of motion and hip range of motion, do they end up with the same incident of ACL and meniscal tears in their knees? That'd be a very good question to find out right. that people who have good distribution of force, are they less susceptible to those really severe injuries that almost 100% of them result in severe degenerative changes, like you said, a decade out? And that I certainly fall into that category, um, you know, from, from injuries. There's a question in the chat um, about, is this, let me go back to that, let me go, how does this compare to other countries? And the well, they're pretty close. There are some countries that are, are a little less than others, but I'm just going to read you in a brand new study that, that I read. Osteoarthritis in general is the fourth leading cause of disability in older adults, the fourth leading cause of disability in the world. And, and it, it, it makes almost, sense, right? It makes right. sense, right? Because if you, if you can't walk and you can't squat, it takes away about 80% of the work you know, opportunities that people have, especially in um, other uh, in other environments, like maybe, you know, right now we're probably 80% white collar workers in the United States. Mm -hmm. But if you think of those that have to do any kind of labor, any kind of, you know, we even think of like our police officers, our firefighters, our uh, anybody working with utilities, people working in construction, uh, you know, arthritis can is what basically takes them out of the workforce. Yeah. I mean, no questions asked. I mean, I can think of multiple friends of mine that work for UPS and 50 years old, their knees were so right. shot they couldn't, mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't mm -hmm. drive for UPS anymore. And it was just, everybody knew it. You were going to get your 30 years in, you know, you start working 20, 50 year out because your arthritis is too bad. There's a question here, a comment from Sarah Edwards from the UK. She says, I'm sure we'll cover this, but it's OA irreversible. For example, with obese clients, is the damage already done? Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to throw something out there for you because this is a great question, Sarah. Um, you know, we think, we believe in our mind in the idea of plasticity. And, you know, we are discovering things all the time. And we're going to talk a little bit about stem cells at the end, uh, mesochymal stem cells. And there is hope that there are some reversibilities of some of these damages. The, the biggest thing that I will remind everybody of is that distribution of movement can reduce the force and obviously losing weight can reduce mm -hmm. the force that even an existing arthritic change can become asymptomatic and we can become functional. So right. as we'll right. talk about this, it, it, mm -hmm. it behooves us to manage weight and to manage range of motion of surrounding joints, as Beth mentioned, also the thoracic spine has a direct relationship to knee. There's a, there's a direct, if your center of gravity is too far forward or you're walking on your heels, it's mm -hmm. gonna lose the congruence of the knee and lead to you know, eventually some kind of wear and tear in the knee, whether it ever becomes symptomatic or not, uh, we don't quite understand, mm -hmm. but the wear and tear will be there. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, let's do that. And I, I'm really glad that you brought up that part of psychological component to it, because I think that, you know, people being able to define who they are by their jobs. You, know, you think of the police officer, the military uh, officer and, uh, you know, the firefighter. And, you know, when they lose that role because of arthritis or the athlete, right, the professional athlete we see quite mm -hmm. often in sport. Mm -hmm. Um, it really messes with their psyche. It's very hard for them. Um, this is another study, and I've used this study before in my pain lectures, but this is just one to, to show you sort of what we're talking about. So the purple color there, um, the line represents arthritis, osteoarthritis in the spine, right? And this is a good indicator that there's arthritis in other parts of our body as well. And what you see on the left vertical, the y-axis is the age, and then the bottom the x-axis is what percentage of this population. Now, this population um, that was tested were normal adults. These were normal adults that did not have complaints of low back pain, right? And so what we're seeing, this was to answer that first question, between the age of 20 and 40, somewhere between 50 to 80% mm -hmm. of the population have degenerative changes, even though they don't have symptoms. 
And that's a pretty big extrapolation to make. It's a little scary, but th these are the numbers. This is what we're looking at is mm -hmm. that the generation starts this early. And I don't want people to be scared of what we're talking about today. I want you to be empowered with the tools that Beth and I are going to share with you to be able to you know, endure it, to be able to work with it, to be able right. to overcome it, to be able to get around it and uh, figure these things out. Let's go to the next slide. And again, we refer to this often as the literature for false positives, right? Here's another one. This is looking at the knee and uh, looking at different types of injury. So if you look at the y-axis again, you see bone spurs, which is degeneration. Uh, Beth will talk about that when she shows an x-ray. Uh, we see cartilage damage, which is also uh, osteoarthritis. So that could be cartilage damage of the, of the actual condyles. It could also be cartilage damage of the meniscus in the knee. Mm -hmm. Bone marrow lesions is also when, typically when the cartilage has been damaged, the bone marrow lesion underneath it will be damaged. Mm -hmm. Synovitis is the connected tissue inside the capsule that uh, provides the synovial fluid and the lubricant for the knee. Um, subchondral cyst is also a form of osteoarthritis. It's where um, the, the fluid and the inflammation in between the damaged cartilage and the bone uh, creates space and can often lead to severe problems. And then meniscal lesion is the meniscus being torn. When somebody says, I tore my meniscus. And then ligaments is the lowest one. <clears throat> the other thing to look at here is these individuals that were measured with an MRI, um, they looked at a matching. So for example, I'm a 58-year-old male with knee pain. They would find a 58-year-old male without knee pain, and they would match. <clears throat> so the numbers are pretty equal. But what, if you look at this, um, blue are those that were in pain that got tested, and green are those that were not in pain that got mm -hmm. tested. And you start realizing what percentage of them, right? The osteophytes was almost 80% mm -hmm. of both populations, mm -hmm. no pain in pain. Cartilage damage, 68 to 70 percent, um, coming down to things like subchondral cyst, almost the same. So I do want you to realize that just because one of us or a loved one or ourselves get diagnosed with an X-ray or an MRI that we have any of these, just remember that there's an equal amount of people out there that have the same exact pathology that are completely symptom free. And so that's and I want to use that for hope. I don't want you to use it to discredit those that are suffering with pain. I've certainly been there. Beth has been there. We, we go there quite often. Um, that's why we're so interested in this topic. So I don't want to dismiss that. But I do use this as a way of establishing hope. Let's go to the next slide. So here is just a, an example. This is an arthroscopic procedure in a healthy knee. So you can see the meniscus and the space and then the big white bulb up above is the condyle of the femur and the white down the bottom is the cartilage on the tibia. So this is what healthy cartilage looks like in the knee. And we're gonna compare this to the next slide, which is damaged cartilage, both in a arthroscopic and an open procedure. So you, you start seeing like the fraying of the cartilage or damage. Um, the bottom right one is a total knee replacement and certainly deserving of one. But you can see that the, not only has the cartilage been worn away, but the bone has also been worn away on the uh, lateral condyle of the femur. So that's looking at the knee bent. And I know it looks a little mm -hmm. bit like your chicken from dinner last night, <laughs> but this is a human femur that we're looking at. Sorry to gross you out, just typical physical therapy humor. <clears throat> but you can see the wear and tear, and you can also see the bone spurs. If you look in the top left of the bottom picture, you can see where there's some spurring as well that's been happened from chronic damage to the knee. And we don't have to keep looking at that. We can go to the next slide. I have another question that's come up while we're looking at this. And okay. uh, Gwen Berwick says, does joint hypermobility mean a person is more or less likely to have osteoarthritis, especially hyperextended knees? And that's a fantastic question. Um, I would say that hypermobility in and of itself does not correlate right with arthritis, but right. instability does. Right. And so the question is, is how do we define hypermobility compared to instability? 
Beth, do you have any uh, any well, tools you know, would use to differentiate those two words? Look, every, when you're hypermobile, most likely your ligaments have a little more laxity to them. So there's a little more natural play. You don't have the support systems that typically maybe somebody else would have. So you got to use the muscular system around it, the perimeter to become a little more like the ligaments to help hold that structure and learn where your body is in space to make adjustments too, so you don't hyperextend the knee. But it's very important that if somebody has a lot of laxity that they learn parameters to work with them and then really build on a lot of strength to, to, support the, to support the joint, especially the knee is extremely vulnerable. You have, you know, it's the femur and the tibia, right? And, you don't, and you've got these wonderful ligaments, but if they have a lot of laxicity, then you got to create the support to the muscles around it to become a part of that support system even more so. And then that knee becomes more stable. And when somebody becomes aware of where their knee is in space, even like when on footwork, where are they? Are they hanging on their ligaments in the back? Or are they able to recognize that and, and correct that? And, that? and again, hyperactivity is not an indicator for osteoarthritis. The instability of it and the lack of congruency is. And I have a simple rule of thumb. <clears throat> you could have a lot of mobility or not a lot of mobility, but if you have control of it with congruence, right then it's not a risk. If you have even limited mobility, but you don't have control of it, then it is unstable, it is in, in, has instability. So just a nice way of thinking of it is, you know, I always give the example of the dancer that has incredible hip range of motion. They can take their foot behind their head, but if you ask them to do a passe develop, they can't lift their leg past 90 degrees. That's an instability. If you don't have control over that range, that's an accident waiting to happen. That's an instability. You don't have control of it. So when you talk about hyperextension in the knee, do you have control of that range? Mm -hmm. Can you moderate? Can you right. control it? And another way of looking at this, I love the literature in yoga, particularly um, uh, his name is slipping my head, but he wrote the book Physiology of Yoga. And I'll put his name into the study after so I have his book behind me. But he talks about the banda and that the banda is a co-contraction mm -hmm. around a joint mm -hmm. complex. Mm -hmm. So even if we have hypermobility, think of yoga having a lot of hypermobility, but not necessarily instability. So mm -hmm. we'll keep those two things separate. The All other right. thing is everything's got to be working together in unison. The whole house yeah. has got to be working. This is not one given area. And there's an awful lot of muscles, muscles that affect the hip and the knee and the foot. I mean, tremendous amount. And everybody's got to play together fairly, but it has to have a good, well-round program. Yeah. Beth, let's take a look yeah. at these knees. Yeah. Who do these knees belong to? Well, guys, these are my knees. My initials are down there. That was in 20, uh, 2020, actually. I have more current ones even. And you can see that on my left knee that I'm really losing space. And then these are becoming a little bit of varus there, opening on the lateral side. You can see that. And, um, and the meniscus is really thinned out. Um, on the next slide, we're going to show you a lot more of the bone spurs. Even, but you can start to see it there. here. Even before you yeah. go there, go back, Melissa. Go back. Something you can look at, we call it sclerosine. Sclerosine is where you see the really prominent white on the edge on that left uh, mm -hmm. tibia. Melissa, can you run your cursor? It's going to, the left is actually on the right side of the screen, just so mm -hmm. everybody knows. There's and an L down there. Yep. Yeah. And if you, if you, uh, right there on the big white line on the bottom bone. On the bottom. Right, we would consider that to be sclerosing. You can also see some of it around the uh, the other bones where it's really white. That's telling you that's where Beth is dealing with some degeneration. Not up high, it's gonna be in the joint, just in the joint. In, in the joint. All right, let's mm -hmm. go to the next one. Now you'll see some more of it. Now it'll be a little clearer for you guys to see here. You see a lot more of here and you can see the tibia plateau and the bone, the extra bone that's in the front of the tibia plateau. Like, Melissa, can you move the cursor to the front? I, I can't, that would be closer to your, your right hand to the front of it. That's and and come, you down. See, come down a little bit. So right you there. see some, yeah, some bones bearing there, which is built up from the arthritis and the lack of ability to get full extension from the, I had a very, 
I had a uh, meniscus repair that went bad uh, by an inferior person. And unfortunately, I was a, that was a choice that I made. I shouldn't have made. I shouldn't have had the surgery. And some bone spurring was left in the back and it prevented some extension for a long time. And so now have, I have a built up of bone, bone spurring and more people. There are some people that have more osteophytes than others. It's not common for everybody to have it, but I tend to build that. And you can see that on my patella. You can see a lot around the patella. And even at the top of the femur there, you can see some more osteophytes. And um, I have some pretty severe patellofemoral syndrome there. So um, I am facing a knee replacement, but I function at a high level. So my x-ray doesn't equal my discomfort. So this is one where those cases where the, the imaging looks worse than the person is presenting themselves. So you have to be really careful with that. And make, I want, we want to make that distinction. So I still work on range of motion, congruency, and, and continue to do everything, standing completely on that leg and doing a squat, a single leg squat is the one thing I can't do. Now we're looking at the interventions that have been shown to be most effective for osteoarthritis. And again, anytime you have questions, we just got a lot of material we want to get through and we're about 40 minutes into it. So we want to keep yeah. moving. But if you have a yeah. question, we'd love to answer that. So this is looking at what, which of the following is the list of things in the question there are recommended by the CDC as the greatest therapy for our osteoarthritis. Now, I don't consider the CDC to be the authority on everything, but I, when I looked at this, I realized, yeah, you're, you're pretty much right on the money. According to how we look at it at the uh, American Physical Therapy Association, how we look at it in the American Osteoarthritis uh, Organization. So pretty, pretty much right on the money. So we'll have you fill that out while we're doing that. Now, um, <clears throat> while you are answering that question, I wanna go back to uh, Liz uh, Batty's question about the hip replacement. And mm -hmm. I'm not gonna take a lot of time on it because we're talking about knees, but whenever I think of surgery, I think of two things. Like I, I sort of identify what procedure I want to have. <clears throat> so I, I, I learned from talking to doctors and therapists, what I think is the best, my own research. And then I look for who is the surgeon that's done the most of them successfully. Um, if I like a surgeon a lot, I would rather that surgeon do the surgery they're most familiar with, even if it's a lateral posterior or an anterior lateral. <clears throat> Today, all of them are using oversized heads and they're having very good results and there's very few, um, if any, dissatisfaction. I think it's like a 98 plus percent satisfaction with total hip replacements now. So mm -hmm. yeah, again, I would want to be happy with the surgeon, make sure the surgeon has great experience with the procedure they do. Um, when I did my research, I wanted to do an anterior lateral. I wanted to use the HANA table with the MATA procedure. And I found a doctor that did all of those things with great experience. And that's what I did. So um, you know, it doesn't mean that the other surgeries are not just as successful. I see lots of patients with many different, you know, twists to the procedure of the doctor that do quite well. Yeah, Beth? Um, if you have a really good surgeon, a posterior lateral comes out looking at the end of three months, just like an anterior. There's just a lot, there's a few more restrictions in the beginning, especially the first three months mm -hmm. that you have to be careful with, with the posterior lateral mm -hmm. in terms of percentage of a hip flexion. Mm -hmm. And we, I get it into that in detail in the course, if you have any interest. And, in and I also give a little hint that um, typically in the posterior, they will have to do a dissection of the muscle. And mm -hmm. so I always ask the doctor to make sure that they don't make the assumption that it doesn't need to be reattached. Um, you know, so that's a concern with the posterior is that the doctor's actually attaching it. Let's see what everybody said. Yeah, uh, let's, let's go. Let's, let's take a look. All right. So which of the following is recommended? So we see weight loss, physical therapy, then increased physical activity, medication, supportive devices, surgery. So I'll tell you the three that you got absolutely right were the bottom three in that order. But let's think about, Beth, what would you say about the top three? What would you put as the single highest recommendation from the literature and CDC? Exercise is the first thing that you want. That's the first line yeah. treatment. So and um, this is and this is beautiful for us, right? As Pilates teachers yeah. and physical mm -hmm. therapists, you see mm -hmm. physical therapy, even more than modalities of a therapist, it is the strengthening and movement 
that comes from physical therapy. So right. um, number one is increased physical activity. Number two in the literature is the is weight loss and then physical therapy and muscle strengthening. So what that tells me is that there are two components that totally fall within the realm of us as Pilates teachers of being able to introduce and educate proper movement right. mm -hmm. and increase their physical activity with Pilates right. and outdoor activity. And those things naturally lead to some weight loss. And only if that doesn't work, do we then go to the next step of going to a physical therapist and the physical therapist should be looking at restoring movement and function and strength as well before we get too caught up on um, medications and eventually surgeries. Right. So if we don't get to every little detail, you're going to get these slides. So don't try to just try to listen now and we're going to make sure you get the material. So this just wanted to give you some take homes on as a Pilates practitioner, where do you start when somebody comes in it? And I want to preface to say that when I start with somebody who comes in with some bad knees and they can barely flex them, I, I like, it's like the elephant in the room for some people. It's like, I, I want, you want to do a really good job, but you really don't know where to start and you don't know how much is yeah. too much and how little is too little. And it's got to be based on the individual, right? We have to look at them, what their tolerance is, you know, what's their motivation, what are their goals? And so you got to take that history. You really, so history point blank, get to know them, get to know what, what their beat is, know what their goals are, know what their current movement patterns are, their pain level or how they perceive the pain, which is really important based on what they can do. Um, look and see what their activity limitations are and then observe them, observe what they do and look at gait deviations and posture. I mean, there's a lot more to this. This is an overall for you. But one of the things you can do really quickly, if you have like Postar, we have an assessment we do. And I want to, you know, we go through these levels of different assessments. Some things are more applicable to somebody with arthritis and some are not. So you got to choose the ones that work for that individual based on their age and their conditioning and ability. So you, if it's a hip, you're going to look at all or even, even not anything. Look at their range of motion for the hip, internal, external, abduction, adduction, flexion, extension. And the same for the knee. Know what is their, what's their capable range of motion. So that's going to help you just get an idea that if you're going to do hip circles and footwork, where you really need to go if they have very little internal rotation about putting them on the equipment to make it more comfortable for them so that you don't get into a flare up right away. And, and balance and check their balance. So we want, I wanted to give you, this isn't everything, but I wanted to give you some key messages for helping move the person. And one of them, which is on the next slide, is probably the first thing that I would put rewriting this is um, you, you want, need to know the client's diagnosis. Yes. Is it mild, moderate, or severe away? But I want the client to become a partner with you in learning to be a part of helping you determine how much is too much or, how, or whatever. So they've got to, they got to be on this plate, but you can say to them, look, I know what I need to do. And I know what I think I want you to do, but we have to see what works for you. And you need to give the feedback and be a part of the team to help me determine exactly where your tolerance are. So you're going to report back to me after this session. We're going to start with this then report back to me and then we we'll see how we do. And then we'll make some adjustments accordingly. So make sure that you're teaching mat work and pre-Pilates work, not just equipment, because sometimes it's easier with somebody with arthritis to start with basic mat than it is than putting on equipment and overloading the joints. Like so the glad you, I'm so glad you said that, Beth, because I think one of the you know, we think of our sedentary lifestyle. The average American now is sitting about 13 hours a day and sleeping about six, seven hours a night. And, you know, we, we tend to think that two or three hours of Pilates or therapy are going to be enough to counteract the effect of sedentarism on arthritis. And that's just not true. And they, we need to be engaged in movement throughout the day, multiple times. Every time we go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. every time we you know, take a phone call, we need to be doing the home exercises. And so if we are not teaching our clients to do the home exercises, which in our work is the mat work, mm -hmm. then we're doing them a great disservice if right. we think they're going to actually get everything they need in the two hours they see us in a week. 
So put, to put that to point, the, the woman I mentioned that came in yesterday with two hip replacements and no Pilates, I had her videotape me doing the four things I wanted her to go home and do twice a day. And those are the pre-Pilates mat things using a TheraBand or without, whatever that was for her. And she, that's her job until we see, I see her in a week so awesome. that she can start getting strong, stronger on her own. So the, you know, the use of video can be very helpful and pictures. So uh, then we, you know, create that program with the client as part of the team, determine their tolerances, test, observe, add, then retest to determine tolerance. You know, that just goes right into the basis of developing a program, test and observe, and then add and retest as needed. Know when to use short lever versus long lever, like a long leg or a bent knee leg. Uh, avoid in-range stretches. There you go back to the hypermobile. Avoid in-range. No that's where injury can occur, right? So that's some, um, let's go to the next slide and we'll knock, we'll finish up these key messages. Well, so while you go on the next slide, I'm gonna answer. Allison McCreary asked about what muscle are we talking about in the hip and it's the rotator. So typically okay. it could be, you know, the gamelles or the piriformis that mm -hmm. they might need to cut through to get access from the greater trochanter. Some now are able to dissect it without cutting the muscles. So that's always better if they do muscle sparing. The anterior also is muscle sparing. So again, talk to your doctor and it's usually a rotator down deep that they have to yeah. cut through. And that's at least in the old, the right. old hip surgeries I'd rehabilitate. Uh, they often would uh, cut the rotators, the posterior rotator, external rotators and not sew them back together again. They just would say they were going to heal. That'd be me. That'd be me. My, my right side, hip is on one side. My right hip is 21 years old and the piriformis was not put back like it should have been. And so I have an atrophied piriformis on the right. So they do expose the posterior capsule and go in there. And sometimes the rotators are taken off. But today they seamlessly put them back on or they should. Let's put it that way. All and right. So there's, there's one more question there before you finish off this slide. And that was from Hannah. And we'll sort of address this as well. But post total knee replacement, how sympathetic should we be to pain in kneeling? I always think we have surgery mm. to be able to live. I would avoid anything contradicted, contraindicated by their surgeon, but is everything else okay to encourage? So that's a great question, Hannah. I think that, you know, when there's a time and a place for everything, and a lot of times this is about desensitizing, and, you know, the surgery is an anterior approach typically. So, um, you know, that's where the scarring and the inflammation is going to be for a while. Kneeling is really challenging for a total knee replacement for quite a while. So mm -hmm. I, do, I do empathize with that. I do try to make accommodations. It's not so much the motion or even the weight bearing, it's the tenderness to the pressure of the front of the tibia and the patella mm -hmm. tendon. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll suspend the knee by putting pads underneath the tibia to be able to allow them to get into a position like a high kneeling or a half kneeling position. Mm -hmm. And again, listening to their doctors, most of the surgeons now are so confident with their total joint replacements, they don't put any restrictions on them after three months. Mm -hmm. So um, again, listening to the doctor, respect the doctor. Uh, typically, it's six months to a year out. They can pretty much do whatever they want to do. The biggest limitation with the total knee replacement is full flexion. So right. they might get 130 degrees, but they're not going to get butt to heel kind of thing flexion. So right. we have to respect right. them. Right. But eventually they should try to get to their knees and most do all the new knees I'm seeing eventually are getting on their knees. So just, just know it can happen. All right, let's finish this out. We got some other really great stuff to share with you. So I don't want to take a lot of time because you're going to get this slide. So it kind of says it for itself. Know that each client will react differently. So no two clients are going to ha have the same um, effect the same outcome, nor are they gonna react the same way. So just be aware of that. And especially depending on how they, how they interpret pain in particular. The goal is to always create a successful movement program without pain, that's your goal. And you're gonna remember that the client has to be part of the team to help you create that. You're gonna, you know what to do, but they have to help you decide how much is too much or, or too little. Use props. Props are very important. I use all kinds of props to help put that person in a good position to get the best congruency I can. Just be careful about putting too many things between the knees so we don't want to ruin the bone rhythms of the body, which is something we talk about in the Force Sprint speaks about. And have we have spoken actually together 
uh, in this, the last time we were together, Brent. So yeah. um, let's go on to that. We got a lot of stuff to, to, to get over. You're gonna get this slide. Yeah, next slide. So this next section here, we're looking at new trends and we got about eight minutes left to go there, which is, is gonna be good. Um, we just wanna see your thoughts and your experience. So many of you are so experienced in this too. You know, what have you heard are new trends for the treatment of osteoarthritis? What are things that are that are out there? And, and of course, you can always put Pilates, but we know that as a given. Um, but what are some other thoughts that you have out there? There are a couple of questions in here regarding weight loss and mm -hmm. that Pilates is not necessarily geared towards weight loss. But, you know, what's That's interesting right. is people that do Pilates do tend to lose weight. And I'd ask you. You know, typically that could be with increased awareness and consciousness of everything, including what the sense of being full is and what we eat or wanting healthier foods or being able to go now and walk or to do activities that you couldn't do before. And we know that by just increasing daily activities and participation and by having increased awareness, um, you can lose weight. On the next level is a nutritionist. And I saw that we have a, new, a certified dietitian on board. And again, getting some help, uh, somebody professional that can really help design right. a nutritional mm -hmm. plan for you is very helpful. Um, I noticed, uh, and I have a close relative that uh, was severely obese and had a, um, a surgical procedure and now has lost about 50 pounds and has commented on how all of his knee arthritis disappeared when he lost 50 pounds. Well, the arthritis didn't disappear. What disappeared? His pain. So again, uh, we know that that's a, a really powerful thing. And I remember I lost about 30 pounds uh, last year during COVID, and I couldn't believe how much better I felt in my lower extremities uh, being down 25, 30 pounds. You know, and then I, I went and I lifted up a 25-pound weight and I walked around with it and realized what I had been carrying around. Exactly. I, mean, I can't imagine somebody that's 100, 150 pounds overweight of what that feels like on your joints. So, again, let's get a few more people to participate. Uh, Melissa, go ahead and show it. I know a lot of people are writing answers because you're writing them out. But let's see what uh, what's coming up. So we see stem cells, turmeric or curcumin, um, soft tissue work, better nutrition, gut health. Mm -hmm inflammatory mm -hmm. diet right on the money yeah. right beth yeah um, stress yeah. management walking pilates cbd cbd yeah curcumin mm -hmm. yeah i've been taking a supplement that uh originally is a nutraceutical for rheumatoid arthritis but helps me with my arthritic changes called roommate and uh, that primarily is curcumin which is a derivative of turmeric that's responsible for anti-inflammatory Awesome. Let's go to the next slide. You guys are right on the money. These are all good. Very good. Natural anti-inflammatories. All right, Beth, you ready to get on your soapbox? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to add some stuff on what is a pro-inflammatory diet, the one that we shouldn't be doing, right? And compare that to an anti-inflammatory diet. Simplified, not, I'm not a dietitian, but just some basic parameters. So these are foods that can cause inflammation, and we want to try to avoid or limit them as much as possible. And the research out there, you know, from Harvard, if you want to look, Harvard newsletters are full of wonderful things on nutrition in terms of anti-inflammatory diets and the cardiovascular disease, strokes, arthritis, Alzheimer's disease, and the causes of having too much inflammation in your body, creating systemic conditions. So living with a diet like that can certainly potentially increase that inflammatory state in your body, which is going to increase problems for articular cartilage too. Let's go to the next slide. Let's, let's, let's look at the stuff you should do. Exactly. So we want to do things that are more anti-inflammatory and keeping it simple. And I think we should give everybody these two slides. What do you think, Brent? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable yeah. with it. Yeah. We'll, we'll so they have it. So, yeah. Cause we don't have a lot of time to go over these, but basically we're looking at increasing your phytonutrients, your healthy fats, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds. And I give you some tips on the left side, very simple stuff, but how to use, you know, more spices in your diet, a more omega-3, not omega-6, omega-3 fatty acids, fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, sardines, 
flax seeds and walnuts and almonds are typically known as nuts that are very healthy fats. And um, turmeric, curcumin. I take tumor, I take curcumin in my and glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. This is not nutrients. These are spices you cook with. But outside of this list of anti-inflammatory foods, we could also be looking at different nutrients we could take in our diet that are also toted as anti-inflammatory. CBD being one of them, uh, curcumin, turmeric, um, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, omega-3. These are just an, a few of the things that we need to, as we have these conditions, start looking at might be good for us, if yeah. you choose. We're not prescribing, well, but we're making we're putting it out there. So do avocados fall into healthy fats? Yes, there it's, that's an healthy fat too. I could have added that. Yeah, avocado. I love avocados. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide. We've got a few more things to talk about. So these are a couple of studies that, uh, that uh, Beth pulled up and I just plopped in here looking at, um, in particular, stem cells mm -hmm. and understanding you know how the mesenchymal stem cells i'll let you talk a little bit about it mm -hmm. again i just want to make it clear we're not endorsing or prescribing in any way shape or form we're just saying that you know there are new therapies there are there is hope out there in the medical world and in the stem cell world for osteoarthritis and i know beth you have been uh mm -hmm. you've taken advantage of this you've experimented okay. with this Maybe mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your experience. Okay. So mesenchymal stem cells, they're a promising source of treatment of a, due to their multipotency differentiation. They, they differentiate into what they need to be and become what they need to be. And that's why they are looking at the sources for mesenchymal stem cells tend to be, yes, the new one is human umbilical cord, a blood cord. Um, stem cells, also adipose fat and bone marrow. So in the United States, there's a bigger use of bone marrow and adipose and, and mixed with PRP as a cocktail that goes into the knee for stem cell uh, for osteoarthritis. Having said that, it's not FDA approved. So anything you do in this world, in this area, is out of pocket at no less than $5,000 to $10,000 at a time if you do that. And I've done stem cells, um, bone marrow and adipose, adipose tissue on the left knee that you saw on the x-ray, probably 2014. I think it did buy me some time. Um, the long-term stu long studies are not there on the longevity of it. There are case studies where people say, yeah, I did that 15 years ago, I'm great, but there's no long-term double-blind placebo-controlled studies showing that they have a lasting effect and, it's, and it clearly is regenerated the articular cartilage. However, the premise is that it will help regenerate the articular cartilage or does it fill in space? Does it fill in a little bit in the areas where the arthritic areas are on the articular cartilage? The long-term studies are not, therefore it's still considered a novel form of treatment. Still something somebody with mild, moderate uh, osteoarthritis might wanna look at, especially if they're symptomatic. But then there are other things that we use like hyaluronic acid injections mixed with PRP that a, a, your orthopedic surgeon might use now to help you with discomfort with your articular cartilage, which shows some clarity that, of building growth factors and helping build some of that articular cartilage. And that's getting off stem from this, but I did throw another thing in there. So start saying the stem cells, it's still a little gray. It's very expensive. And umbilical cord blood is not FDA approved in this country, only for blood, blood, some blood, um, blood studies related to blood deficit, blood genetic issues. So uh, just to, to throw something out there too for clarification is that like PRP is using your own uh, right. blood cells and plasma to be able to facilitate an inflammatory response. So we're always playing with this balance. Like we want inflammation to uh, strengthen or to create like the PRP uh, that a lot of osteopaths and doctors are using to tighten up a joint. Right. So, or a ligament that is too loose, a sacred iliac joint, an ankle ligament, um, you know, tendons that are, you know, too stretched or not working is to irritate them and uh, maybe put some PRP in them to get them so that the inflammatory response heals the tissue and can tighten the tissue. 
stem cell is meant to be able to create new cells. So that's the hope right. of spinal cord right. research and brain trauma and organs is like trying to be able to get these uh, mesenchymal stem cells that will act like the new cell, whatever it is, they're, they're cells that are going to evolve into the other cells of the body. And that's the, where the research is just booming right now. Right. And I mean, I can't imagine the next five years, we're going to have so much research telling us sort of what works, didn't work, what kind of catalysts have to be there, et cetera. And then a lot of times, you know, the, the doctors are exploring with these things and, um, you know, some people are having good results and some are not having any results. So we just got to keep our nose yeah. to the grindstone. There are two more questions. And then I just want to close with a couple announcements and uh, some expression of gratitude. Um, Sarah asked a question about um, osteoarthritis in the hands and osteophytes in the hands. That's something that I've been dealing with. I've been dealing with a lot of arthritis in the hands. Of course, I've been doing physical therapy, manual therapy for well over 30 years. Um, one of the things that I'm finding right now is just, again, inflammatory control. So I've really been focusing on a diet and also on the um, nutraceuticals that I'm taking to really be based on anti-inflammatory and to eat foods that are um, going to reduce um, Another one of some anti-aging ones, I use Reservatrol that also mm -hmm. I think is helping me, but I've noticed a big difference in my hands over the last, you know, six to six months or so where I was having real problems with uh, snapping tendons and trigger mm -hmm. fingers and joint pain, a little bit of deviation of the knuckles based on the kind of work that I do. And then the next question that came up was blood type diet is also very interesting. Uh, again, I, I'm not a dietitian, so I don't want to make any claims on things. But yeah, there are a lot mm -hmm. of things that mm -hmm. when you match up the right foods to your body type, um, and especially focusing on things that are anti-inflammatory, the majority of our disease today, I teach the pathophysiology course at the University of St. Augustine in the physical therapy department. And the majority of disease that we look at you know, today is inflammatory and autoimmune-based and so it's probably just because the, the biggie in there is processed foods. I think I always go back to Michael Pollan's very simple suggestion of eat real food, eat less, mainly plants. And uh, you know, that allows me to have my occasional steak or the chicken soup that I like to have. But the idea of being more on the plant based and eating real food. And one of the things he says is if your grandma can't read the label or make sense of the, the label, you probably shouldn't eat it. If it's in the middle of the grocery store, you probably shouldn't buy it. And uh, in the closer you can get to shaking the hands with the farmer, the better. So, you know, I use those guidelines. He says the outside of the grocery store typically are going to be more of the healthier foods and fresh foods than what you get in the middle rows. The last one here was um, what about red light treatment? And when you're looking, I mean, there's again, we're light animals. So infrared and laser and there, Low level there, laser. Are, some, mm -hmm. there are some uh, intravenous lasers now that they're doing and intraarticular lasers mm -hmm. uh, that are phenomenal out of Germany that we've had some connection with. I think, Beth, I think you were there when we had them mm -hmm. come in, right? Were you there when mm -hmm. we had a workshop? So they came in and they basically do a catheter into the joint and they can put in the different laser lights and infrared lights and it's amazing at how cells respond to light. That's what the kind of animal we are. We respond to light. So there's a lot of things out there. We're going to keep yeah. our eyes open yeah. for it. Beth, any last comments or things you want to share before we close down today? I just want to shout out to the person who brought up gut health. You know, if you're really dealing with that, you got to really work with a good nutritionist or dietitian to work on that. Because yes, I do believe that your gut is the seed of how you break food down. And if it's not broken down correctly and getting into the right, no matter what you're eating, yeah. anti-inflammatory or not, it's not getting to where you need. So certainly and, that is something to look at if you're dealing with that. And you know, and that. that is the basis of functional medicine, uh, mm -hmm. which I love and uh, really support is looking at the gut is the brain and the gut is where everything happens. Right. All the synthesis right. of our, mm -hmm. you know, the normal mm -hmm. biome that helps us synthesize proteins and polypeptides right. and neuropeptides all takes place in the gut. So 
Um, that's also where we can manage a lot of our inflammation. I, I think Ren and I will have to come back on one day and talk a little bit more about these new interventions because I think, the, like Bryn said, the research is coming and I'm really hopeful that we can find some regenerative medicine that's going to make changes in their articular cartilage and arthritis for the future. We're still a little early um, and just hang in there. I think it might happen. Uh, the studies we'll are coming. For, you know, we'll look for some experts to come join us too, Beth. So we'll find yeah. somebody out there that, that we know. And I think that's a good just, idea. All, all we can do is bring information uh, to ourselves and to study and search things out and try to be as clear minded as possible. Take the, the politics of, and the money of all these things, the greed <laughs> of these, and take them away and look at, you know, what are the facts? What is the science? How does that pertain to me? Um, Beth, I can't thank you enough. And thank you. Uh, really excited. Was... Your, your course is back up on the docket, I saw. So there are still some spaces for it, not many. Uh, Happening talking, in March. I was talking to our admissions uh, employees, and they were telling me that it's filling up fast. So that's great news, and it always does. Um, also, we'll send you the link for Beth's book. She uh, One of the first books out in the Pilates industry, looking at rehabilitation, particularly knees and hips, arthritis, and total joints. So that's a, a great resource. And uh, uh, just trying to think of anything else that I want to share with you. We'll be back next week. This was another great. Another webinar. We appreciate you. We couldn't have a webinar without you. You Thank make you the so webinar much. great. Share it with a friend. It's always free. And if you can't make it great. live, you can get it at home. It's our way of uh, giving back to the community. We've yeah. certainly been blessed and are so grateful for you. Be kind, uh, seek truth, and we'll see you in a week. Bye, everybody. Be well. Bye.